Welcome to another episode of the Humming Projector podcast. My name is Ivan Moik, and with me today I have my good friend Douglas Warren again. How are you, Doug? Oh, doing just fine. Not bad for a very cold Sunday morning. <laughs> That's good. Um, last time you and I met, uh, we had a discussion about digests. Today's topic is not about film directly, uh, genre-wise or, or other. It's about the other uh, complementing important part of this hobby, and that is projectors. And I thought about starting with uh, our first memories of projectors. Uh, would, would, you, would you start with that? Uh, what, what is your first memory of a, of a projector for you? Uh, for me, it was my uh, my late father. Uh, he bought a, a Brownie movie camera and projector set in the mid nineteen fifties. We had an old Brownie three hundred uh, standard eight millimeter projector that he would, you know, show our home movies on that he would shoot with the camera. And uh, I guess my big memories of it was just uh, it was very loud. It was a very loud machine, and. Uh, very bright because those had extremely strong bulbs in them. And uh, I was just fascinated by it. You know, I just, you know, I used to love movie night because we only did movie night once or twice a year. So we didn't exactly burn out on it or anything. It was a, it was an event for us when dad pulled out that projector and said it was time to watch movies. And that was my first exposure actually to package films because my dad had an Abbott and Costello film that he dearly loved that we would watch along with the films he shot. So that was my first uh, experience or impressions of uh, movie projectors. I guess even at that young age, it kind of got me hooked. My first uh, projector was uh, my parents' Yumig P8 Duel from 1968. Um, We only had family movies. And uh, we watched them a lot. And we started with the standard eight. We mostly had those, but uh, at the end of the of the era, we had a couple of super eights that we also shot um, with a Bauer camera that we still have. And I actually shot a couple of new films on that one. And uh, I would say that that projector really was an important part why I am now into this hobby again, because that was a mechanical wonder. I'm still fascinated by that magic that this tiny projector could could make with moving this film watching that frame by frame making that into a live action i remember the feeling when i was allowed when i was big enough to be allowed to actually operate that projector i'm i mean my older brother or my, or my father was always behind me but I, I was allowed to to operate that and take the responsibility of turn it quickly off it if it uh, stopped moving the film so i didn't burn through the through the film but that was a strong feeling, and I, I think that's an important part why I'm still into this hobby. And that turns uh, into the uh, first subtopic, and that is passion and feelings. Because there's a lot of passion and feelings uh, when it comes to projectors. Why does this happen when film is what it's actually about? Uh, I mean, we say we are collect films, but I think for many, projectors are if not as important, it's uh, absolutely a big part of the hobby. And, and why do you think we have such a passion for the, for the projector? I think uh, it's, it's the films and the projectors, you can't really have one without the other. If you're passionate about uh, film, you're more likely going to have an equal passion for the projector. And of course, the quality of, quality of the film being projected it's going to depend largely on the quality of the projector you're using. I mean, um, showing a film on, say, something like a GAF compared to an Elmo is going to be two different experiences completely. So I think we bond with certain brands. Uh, I know I have. Well, since I got back into the hobby now about nine years ago, and I've got more knowledgeable, and I've had more hands-on experience. And uh, so... Uh, Try, no, I'm not to stray too far off course, but I, I do think that that's a big part of it because the two do go hand in hand. There's no way around it. And what fascinates me is uh, when I watch the film, we always have that humming uh, from the projector. And I know some people try to have a silent projector as possible and others like the humming. Me personally, I like to hear the projector. It's part of the experience. 
it reminds me that it's a technical wonder behind me doing this work. And so it's part of the experience. I, I fully agree. The noise the projector makes for me personally is part of the experience. If the projector was completely quiet, I would feel like I was watching the DVD. You know, <laughs> uh, I like the... I like all the sounds, and this may sound strange, but even the smells associated when you're running film. There's something about when you pick up a projector and you can, it has a certain scent about it, you know, that's all part of the experience, in my opinion. You know, yeah. the heat that it puts off and everything else. It doesn't matter if you're into projectors or not as such. Um, no matter what uh, kind of relationship we have with the projector, it's no denying that we actually have to spend a lot of time with that projector. <laughs> I mean, no film without a projector. Exactly. Yeah, and I also feel that um, I know it's probably a topic we want to talk, we want to touch on today, since we're focusing on projectors. But unfortunately, they don't make new movie projectors anymore, and they haven't for a very long time. And um, you unfortunately unless you've got a lot of money and have you're lucky enough to have a repair person close by which most of us don't and there's not that many of them left to do this kind of work and you're gonna have to learn to do part of the work yourself or you know if it breaks you just go buy another one but you know i've had to learn how to work on mine because i can't afford to have them fixed yeah but I, when I thought about it, the, the kind of relationship I have with my uh, projector is like fiddling with some old mechanics, reminding me from times in the past. I had kind of a similar feeling with uh, model railroads because it's it's something, a technical wonder from the past that we like mm -hmm. to fiddle with. And when I had that thought, I actually, uh, the first thing I thought about was actually uh, the classic home cinema with Phil Sheard because he also had a model uh, railroad uh, shop, I think. Uh, I, I think he sold both of it. I hope I'm right when I say this, but I th think I am. Uh, and also vintage cars uh, is something that's kind of similar thing that we, we really are fascinated by that old mechanical wonder that by today's standard might not be that impressive, like being able to show an image on a screen, but I can't stop being fascinated by the mechanical part of it because we are so used to electronics these days, but uh, it's something special with the mechanics that the projectors have. Well, I think part of it too is being an older type of tech. It's going to sound like a cliche, cliche, I know, but let's be honest. The old machines are made better than most consumer products are nowadays. There's a reason Definitely. why, you know, you have projectors made in the 40s and 50s that are still around and they still operate. Stuff was made to last back then. And, yeah. uh, and I think, too, uh, you know, if you have an interest in any kind of old tech, it kind of goes across, it, you know, it, it can flow across the board. You know, like you mentioned cars. I used to work on motor scooters and mopeds, and it was kind of a similar thing because most of the technology in that was something that was pretty ancient because they were fairly simple machines, and I used to ride those. And um, I kind of feel that way when I pop open the back of a projector and start looking around. You know, it's, it's, this is tech from 50, 60 plus years ago. Of course, I'm a kind of a vintage guy anyhow, so I enjoy doing this very much. You know, I like it. Some may not, but it's all part of it for me. It's part of the joy of it for myself. Yeah, absolutely. And I try to categorize collectors. Now, I think there's two main types of collectors when it comes to projectors. There are those like me that don't have that many projectors. I can name them there. I have a, a few. I have a... Uh, Yumiga 10, I have a GS1200 uh, for the 60mm, I have two Elmo 16CLs and, and one older Bell & Howell, but I don't have that many i5 projectors. But there are also those that have, I mean, a storage full of projectors, they have them all, uh, a couple of each type too. So where are you on that scale? Uh, do you have usually had one or two or, or a lot? Well... When I got back into the hobby back a few years ago, I kind of went on a bit of a buying spree. And at one point, I had quite a few. And um, I mean, from silent sound, you name it, you know, standard Super 8 16. But over the past couple of years, I have really whittled that down. And I, I have donated probably next close to 30 projectors over the last five, six years. 
And now I'm down to um, just a few. I've got two different uh, sound uh, Super 8 projectors. My 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 main one is an Elmo uh, ST1200D. And I also have been, I've been a fan of a lesser known Japanese brand called Copal that have the most 70s, 70s looking aesthetic about them you can imagine but they're very solid heavy machines and i have the most i have like three or four of them i get find them cheap i buy them and i fix them up i really like them and they have some unique features on them and um i've got a few dual eight machines and one standard eight machine back which is an old um, elmo from i think the late 50s early 60s but uh, i have whittled down my collection quite a bit and I used to be into 16, but I got completely out of that into the hobby about two years ago. And uh, there are also two other types of uh, collectors, if, it, if we look at that from a different angle. And there's those that uh, swear to one type of projector and those that try as many different kind of projectors. Yeah, I would be in the latter category. <laughs> but the ones you hear the most from are those that swear to one type of projector i guess one type of brand those are the, the most vocal ones uh, <laughs> and that uh, is a segue to our next next subtopic uh, that is how we are a divided group i mean we are one group in the sense that we all love film but uh, sometimes when you look into forms you 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 can have also a feeling that projectors can divide people uh, there are some common discussions that quickly turns up some heat uh, like mm -hmm. um let's say just the brand name Elmo. I mean, when I think about different kind of projectors, I don't think there's any other brand that will turn up as much feelings as an Elmo projector does. Some will scream that they scratch film, others will swear by them. Um, I have a GS1200 myself, I'm happy with that, but some would say that uh, it's um, an expensive machine to, to um, scratch your film. And um, I don't have any other way to put it than uh, projectors also could turn into tribalism uh, to turn us into tribes that fight each other um, or uh, the similarities to football teams where you really are fanatic by your team and try to, to fight for your team. And you don't see the same things for other parts of this hobby, like genres. We, we are respective. Uh, I know you're more into uh, like all types of Maybe horror films or or uh, uh, King Kong or uh, sorry, what's the other Japanese one? Uh, <laughs> Godzilla. <laughs> oh, exactly. Oh, how could I miss that? Um, but people respect that. You say, "Oh, you're into that. So that's okay. I'm more into cartoons or whatever." Uh, or you can have some sort of discussion for where to treat your film with film gar or not, for example. But there are no such other thing than projectors that will turn up the heat in the same way as projectors, I think. Yeah, I can honestly say some of the worst arguments I've seen break out in film forums has been in regards to projector choices. I've seen some flame wars totally blow wide open because somebody made some comment about a particular projector and somebody who owns that unit gets offended and comes in and tries to defend why they, you know, and it just, it goes from there. I don't personally understand that. I mean, it's like food. We all have different choices and different things we like, you know, I like this machine. You like that machine. Who cares as long as it works for the, you know, the individual. I personally don't understand that kind of mindset, but each to their own, I guess, you know, uh, and I'll be honest, I'm in the, I do like Elmo projectors. Uh, my SC1200, which I got bought, um, needed work. I refurbished it and got it working, and it has performed flawlessly for me. And I haven't had a single film get scratched on it, so it works well. An analogy for me is that you don't comment on your other people's babies. I mean, if you see a baby in a trolley, you, do, you don't exactly. comment on other people's babies. <laughs> Yeah, that's a wonderful analogy, by the way. <laughs> yeah, so I, I think people take it very, very personally for some type of projectors. That's my impression, at least. Um, and mm -hmm. I think that gets in the way of something really important, uh, and that is knowledge sharing. I mean, we are a small group. Um, the main era of the projectors and films are in the past, and we really have to rely on sharing our knowledge 
And what makes me a little bit sad is when I see really knowledgeable people kind of being counterproductive by letting their feelings overflow the knowledge sharing. I mean, the difference of make some uh, point about projector might scratch your film and screaming the same. <laughs> it's all about timing. <laughs> I mean, the worst, absolute worst type of bad timing I can see is that when you see a new person to the hobby and being happy and saying, look, I, I bought this new projector. I'm, I'm really excited. And then some senior uh, knowledgeable person comes in and say, you know, that projector scratches film. You should never have bought that. You should have blah, blah, blah. That really frustrates me because if you just take a step back and 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 say things more, um, uh, let your feelings not get in the get in the way. You you can actually do something, but when you scream the same thing, nobody listens. Yeah, people could be a lot more tactful about it. Tactful about it. I agree. Uh, there's no faster way to kill a a, uh, a new person's interest in the hobby than come in and start slamming what they've picked up. I mean, there's tactful ways to handle that. I mean, you know, if you, if you want to speak to them about it privately, don't do it on a, don't do it on a public forum and don't talk down to the person. Again, I have seen this and I have seen, and I know for a fact, uh, I've seen one or two people pretty much disappear from the hobby because they had to deal with people like that right up front. And that, yeah. that would kill it for anybody. It would have killed it for me if I was young and I was getting into it and I had people like that coming out. You know, you felt like you're being attacked. Uh, yeah. Like you said, share your knowledge. Um, be tactful. Be helpful. You know, that, and we got to be totally honest here. This is a very niche hobby. How many of us are yeah. left? I mean, I would love to know if there's any numbers worldwide, how many people are still in this hobby. It cannot be a lot. And why do you want to run away you know, cause new people to run away from it because of high mindedness, I guess is the way to put yeah. it. And no matter if you're right, if you say the same thing for the 90th time uh, and everybody have heard it before, perhaps you don't contribute any more extra by saying it one more time. <laughs> so it's all about exactly. timing, I guess. Yeah, I absolutely. I agree. I agree. Fully. But I would say that's mm -hmm. nothing unique to this hobby, though. I've been a beekeeper. Um, and I would say that beekeeping is surprisingly uh, heated when it comes to a few topics like treating against varroa mites or um, how to uh, feed your bees, what kind of feeder you should use. You would be amazed of how uh, passionate some beekeepers can be on that subject. So I, I guess it goes with any hobby, though. And this is true. I'm in the uh, my other hobby is scale modeling. And uh, we have a name for people that do this sort of thing. We call them rivet counters. You know, the people that will yeah. look at another person's build and will just kind of tear it apart. And it's like, you know, yeah. it just causes, uh, I don't know, dissension in the ranks. I I don't understand, again, that mindset. You know, come on, you know, we're all in a hobby. It's for fun. This, we're in this because it's, it's supposed to be fun. Exactly. You know, and I've seen people totally in any and all hobbies I've been in, you're always going to have a few that are going to come in and try to drain every ounce of fun out of it and, that's that's not right you know let's let's celebrate the joy that we all have you know being in the hobby that's how i feel about it yeah i i think many do it with the right intention but with the absolutely mm -hmm. opposite effect than what they probably <laughs> want in the first place i mean the road to yes, hell is agree. paid with good uh, intentions absolutely absolutely i fully agree again and we have um, different kind of preferences, like uh, do you want a simple or a complex projector? I mean, the GS1200 is a complex projector. Uh, it's a wonder when it works, but of course it makes it possible for many more ways to break down. <laughs> the electronics is more complex. Of course, there are more parts that can go wrong. So um, people will think a little bit different on what they prefer with that. Uh, it's obvious for me that my 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 Yumig A10 is simpler to look at if something fails than the GS1200. That's kind of like my Copal uh, sound projector, the 402. It's very, I mean, compared to like my ST1200, it's a much simpler machine. And um, you pop it open, it's a lot less intimidating to work on. <laughs> it's like the difference between popping the hood on a VW Beetle and you know, a Maserati, I guess. <laughs> yeah. 
And something that we touched on in, in the beginning is uh, the preference for uh, whether the, the projector should be a really silent one or if that is not important. I mean, of course, if it sounds like a tractor, it might be a little bit much. My, my old Bell & Howell from the 60s, 60 millimeters, it's, it's quite loud. But apart from that, I don't mind uh, listening to the projector. It's, it's part of the fun for me. But oh, my point too. is, there are many different parts of the projectors that is not objective. It's it's a subjective feeling, subjective feeling. If you think some some aspect of the projector is important to you or not, um, and there there are a few things to think about when you get a projector. I mean, uh, how important is the real size of the projector? I at the Super Eight database we have. Um, imported uh, the projectors from this old Super 8 data site. And we have imported 1,590 devices. And that made it possible to run a little bit statistics on the projectors. Um, and we can see that from those 1,590 devices, 10% we have the missing info, uh, which kind of real size it had. But 51% of all the models made had 400 reels as the maximum real size. 29% had 600 as the maximum real size. 5% had 800 as the real size. And just 1% had 1,200 as its real size. So, I mean, 400 and 600 reels turns into 80% of all different kind of models made. Not the total sold, but the total of different models. I mean, some people think it's important to have big reels because you can spool them up uh, and, and watch it in one go. Um, but they were sold mostly in 400 and in later years, maybe 600 as well. So how important that is, I I think we are back again to your preference. Um, well, I think uh, like, okay, like myself, I'm mainly a digest in shorts. Uh, short film collectors, so 400 foot, four to 600 foot works well for me. I did want a machine that could do larger than that, which is why I wound up with the Elmo ST1200D. And so it's there if I want to, you know, watch 800 or 1200 foot. But honestly, I like 800, I'd like the 400 foot just because um, if I'm not in the mood to sit through a whole Super 8 feature, I can watch one, two reels and I'm done. I can come back to it later. That's the way I tend to, that's how my projecting habits are. That's how I like to uh, run film. And personally, I like to do actually the reel change. I mean, I don't mind the changing the reel for every 400 feet. Well, of course, we are talking Super 8 now. Um, but the same goes for a 60 millimeter. I, I don't mind changing the reels once in a while. Um, no, me but, neither. Uh, yeah, but, but I see the point. If you if you want to keep the flow of the, of the movie you're watching, of course, you don't want to change the reel, but but that is a big part of it for me. So so for me, I have a GS1200, but it's not very often I actually watch a 1200 reel on it. I have a couple, but it's not very often. And moving on to sound, uh, to look at the statistics again from Super 8 database, we have, uh, of the 1590 devices, we have 3% missing information out of the sound, uh, but 40% had sound and 57% were silent. So it's roughly half and half. And I guess a few of the sound won't exist still, but I guess that uh, more of the sound projectors are those that are kept today than the silent one, I, I would presume. I think too, with silent projectors, uh, that was most people's introduction to film. I mean, it was for me and apparently it was for you as well. And um, some people, We'll say, oh, there's no place for silent projectors anymore. You know, you can run a silent, you know, film on a sound projector. But I still personally keep a few silent projectors around because for me, my own opinion, it's less wear and tear on my more expensive sound machines. And there were a lot of different models sold back in the day. I mean, these days when you look at oh, forums, yes. you, can, you can get the impression that there's just a few uh, famous ones that uh, were the big sellers. But if you if you look at the statistics again, again, it's not about the total amount sold uh, of units sold, but about the diff different kind of models. There were, were a lot of brands, um, and many of them will not many different kind of models, but we have 283 different brands of Super 8 projectors in the database. Uh, and by the number of most 
uh, different kind of models. You have Yumig on top, and then you have Bell and Howell, then Bauer and Elmo, Review, Norris, and Jenan. But when you look at the graph, what amazed me was that there's just so many different kinds. So uh, if you if you look at how many different kind of models were there, except for the the top list of well-known names, there were bunches. And there was also a lot of rebranding too. I know that UMIG uh, actually got rebranded as Bell and Hal over here in the States in the late seventies. And um, you saw a lot of that too. Uh, the two big U.S. brands at that time back then was, of course, Kodak and Bell and & Howell. And um, unfortunately, a lot of the projectors that were made in the 70s from both brands have not held up well. Uh, they have uh, the gears and everything else inside have eventually, because of the, the nature of the nylon they use has disintegrated. So a lot of dead projectors out there, unfortunately. But yeah. um, and it's a shame because both brands did pretty quality machines, but they eventually declined in quality, which may be another reason why people like Bell and Howe started uh, importing other manufacturers and labeling them as Bell and Howe's. And this was a big business because actually I can see from the database oh, as yeah. well the manufacturers and the top manufacturer that was Silma, not the name you would expect, and the reason mm. probably was that it was sold as many different brands all around. Uh, although it actually made a lot of projectors, it was not the name you would expect to be on the top list. Following with Yumig, Yamava, Belco Own, Bell & Howell, Elmo, Norris. So there were a lot of rebranding all, all around. Um, and uh, the same type of model could be sold with many different names. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um... And several of the uh, brands you mentioned, like Norris, that's uncommon here in the U.S. Uh, a lot of those brands are probably more familiar to the Europeans than they would be for people here in the States. I know that um, Elmo, of course, did make, you know, did get a toe hold, toe hold over here because it's, you know, it's, it's Elmo. They had good distribution. I, to be totally honest, I have to say the Japanese brands like Elmo and the Copals I have, those are my go-to machines. I've just found them long-term. They've had the the best quality, the most consistent. And I've had the least amount of trouble with them. And I've ran, I've ran both uh, machines heavily and haven't really had any issues, you know. And uh, But I know there's other... I know the UMIG... I, I, I have to say, though, I do... I have a special place in my heart for you, Mig, because my very first sound projector was one, and it ran like a champ for a very long time. I'm I'm very fond of the brand. I just don't have any in my possession now. Not to say I won't one day. I may pick up another one. I may very well. <laughs> and again, when you come to the big names in this hobby now, it's models that wasn't sold in big numbers, I guess, back in the day. That's easy to forget because we get focused a lot on those who obviously were left in the hobby that want the big, biggest models, the best mm -hmm. models, but that was not the ones that were sold the most back in the day. For instance, on the top list, I would say we have the Buley 708, we have the Elmo uh, GS and ST1200, and the Fumio. I mean, I mean, how many Fumios were sold back in the day? But I know a lot of people dream about the Fumio. I saw one at Blackpool now, the last Blackpool. Um, David Watson had one. It's a glorious machine, but super, super heavy. It's a beautiful machine. It's absolutely gorgeous, yeah. Yeah, but doesn't represent what was common back in the 70s, of course. Well, well, you know, you have to, you know, to get right down to brass tacks, this was a consumer, this was a mass consumer product. There's a reason why, you know, there's still thousands of these little, you know, silent dual eight machines that are floating around because it was just that. It was a consumer product. And when we look at the situation today, because it's been a long time since the projectors were produced. We run into some issues now. Uh, I mean, you can get some bulbs or belts or rollers and other spare parts, but it's more and more difficult to find the parts. Um, last week, I, I saw the news that the BRK exciter lamp no longer is produced, uh, and we'll see that more and more. So what's your thoughts on the future in this hobby? 3D printing is going to keep... Um... A lot of these machines alive there's no way around it i mean 
That's kind of the future, and I think you know who I'm speaking of that specializes in this. I guess I and, guess all uh, the listeners are as well. <laughs> yeah, they, thank goodness for him because um, that's, that's what he offers out there. If, it, if he wasn't offering what he has on the market, a lot of these machines would be silent forever. Yeah, yeah. And 3D, 3D printing is definitely going to make... Uh, is going to extend the hobby, the life of these projectors. Let's be honest, their mechanical devices are not going to live on forever. And uh, and as you pointed out, parts are getting more difficult to find, especially the electronic components. You know, you're going to get to the point, well, well, I'm on my last pair of parts machine. What am I going to do? Yeah. And of course, the one with uh, 3D printing is is Fanek in, in the Netherlands. And thanks God for him. He's uh, done a mm-hmm amazing job on making new parts Absolutely. Uh, and cnc uh, routers is also important of course and he makes uh i, I bought a loop former from him and, and i'm offering uh, and a lens holder uh, and he makes gears and knobs and all sorts of things but there are the electronics that you talked about that's of course a different league it's more much more complex to produce but there are a few ones that makes uh electronics we have uh, philippe murat i hope i said that correctly uh, in france uh, he made many different kinds of uh, boards. Uh, I bought a motor board for my GS500 from him. Uh, and that's amazing. I mean, people taking their time to, to make these boards and, and, and do things like that. I mean, there is no money into this. This is pure love. But there are some, of course, this, it's not a common, but it's, there are some people like Philip that give me hope for my projectors in the future. Yeah, those are the folks, like you said, just for the sheer love of the hobby, because goodness knows they're not getting rich off of doing these kind of things. But um, they're the ones that will help to keep it alive 10, 15, 20 years down the road. You know, like I said, my, my, my Elmo, I think, is 40 years old. My Copals are closer to 50. I mean, how many more years are these machines going to have? I mean, I take extremely good care of my projectors. But still, everything, like I said, mechanical wears out eventually, yeah. you know. Yeah. And so thank goodness for these individuals who are dedicated enough to the hobby to, you know, to keep it going for us for parts. There are a few more names. I can mention a couple of them. We have um, Cesar Ballesteros. I, I hope I said that correctly again, uh, from Spain, who who uh, has the site tested to great cameras. I bought a, a mm-hmm. remote control for my G1200 from him. I, I love it. And we have sync boxes from Renzo Dalbo. Um, so thanks to all those that d- do this kind of work. It's, it's uh, really appreciated. So for those new into the hobby, maybe you have a few listeners that are uh, new into this hobby, but don't necessarily have a projector yet or have one but want to extend. What would you recommend for those new to the hobby? What what would, should they look for when buying a projector? I think it's going to depend upon uh, what kind of films they collect. Are you just going to be collecting silent films? Say you're a fan of the silent era. You know, you want to, you collect Chaplin, you know, you you collect Buster Keaton. That's your thing. Well, then you would be looking for a quality, you know, dual eight projector. Um, Sanyo may produce some very good ones. I think some of the best. And as far as silent projectors Uh, for sound, I'm going to, I'll probably, I may get blasted for this, but I'm going to roll with it. I'm going to say, Elmo, do Don't your research. <laughs> <laughs> do your research. Uh, uh, the Super 8 database has a wonderful um, section on projectors, which is the ideal place to go to research. Uh, okay, like in this case, Elmo machines. I'm going to have to, um, uh, for sound, for Super 8 sound, I'm going to have to say Elmo. It's just, there's such a good network of people that have them. The part, they're more available, parts are more available for them and so forth. Uh, that's my recommendation. And you may ask which model. Well, there's several models. That's where your research will have to come in there. You know, I'm not saying you have to get like an SC1200 out of the chute, but there are other cheaper models that were produced that are still good machines. Uh, do your research. Yeah, and a couple of things to consider is how easy to get parts. Uh, are parts still mm-hmm. available? Uh, how easy is, is the projector to repair? Uh, mm-hmm. Do you have a very dark room to watch your films? Or uh, is it more more light into the room so we might consider a 200-watt lamp? And 
one thing I um, would say is that if you're new to this, don't plan for everything. If you want that ultimate machine, you have to put a lot of money into uh, into your projector. Yes. So perhaps go for a cheaper one and see what you like or dislike when you're a little bit more into the hobby. And, and when you have had that for a while, you probably will have a better idea of what to go for next. And there is never wrong to have two projectors because that one day when you want to watch a film and you have a technical problem, you would absolutely love to have that spare projector <laughs> as well. Uh, I. I absolutely recommend that you're in the part, the hobby is addictive. You buy one projector and you wake up the next morning and there's three more that's in your living room. <laughs> it's just going to happen. You're going to start once, if you really get into the hobby, you're going to collect more than one projector. You're going to have several. And as you pointed out, it's, it's a good, it is a practical, a pragmatic thing because, uh, you have one breakdown, you've got another one in the wings to set up. And I have done this before. I know you probably have too, where, yeah. you know, a bulb has went out. Oh, I don't have a bulb right now for this machine. Well, I've got the other one I can pull over and finish watching my films on. And um, you, I do want to touch on something very quickly. You talked about, um, you spoke of working on them. And that's something we could actually, I guess, at another on another podcast go into. But uh, that is yeah. something that you have to take into consideration. I don't want to scare anybody off from the hobby, but eventually you're going to, it's really wise to learn to do at least the basics. You know, you're, you know, changing belts is probably the first thing yeah. and oil, learning how to properly oil the machines and so forth. And you'll learn more as time marches on uh, with it. But uh, I, your point about, you know, don't, you know, you may not want to go for the most expensive machine, straight off because what if the hobby's not for you you're going to be out of a lot of money and the way the market is you may or may not be able to get your money back on the machine if you try to sell it yeah and that's one thing and the other thing is that uh, an expensive machine it hurts a lot more when it breaks down <laughs> oh yes i mean yes if, uh, if you have to give up on the machine you would be less sorry for a cheap one for sure so absolutely again if you're new to this uh that's something to consider by the way, that's a wonderful point. I think that's uh, that's an excellent point. Before we finish, I want to do a plug for my other project, the Super 8 database. Um, we have, as I said, imported the amazing work from the old Super 8 data site that's, that is unfortunately abandoned, and it had a couple left uh, license, so I was able to pick it up. And I would recommend you go there to look at the different models if you want to compare the different kind of models. We actually have a, a compare function so you can compare two models uh, side by side and look at the different kind of attributes and see how they compare uh, and organize the different kind of sections uh, so it's easier to 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 read uh, the data from the from the projector. So I would recommend you go there. Uh, we try to build up on the, the database and add more pictures uh, to the database. So if you have some uh, pictures of our projectors that uh, could be useful for others to see, please send them uh, to the Super 8 database. Uh, we also try to collect manuals, repair manuals, especially uh, for the projectors, and that will come handy for others. So if you have that too, please send them. If you have scanned them yourself, because I don't want to take other people's work for free. So yeah. Take a look at the database uh, and compare the, uh, the projectors, and perhaps you would uh, learn something new about your uh, projectors or other projectors you might consider. Sounds good. Is there something you want to add before we wrap up? No, I think that's it. I mean, honestly, there's so much more we could talk about on this topic. Uh, I think we just kind of scratched the surface, but it would roll into a three-hour podcast, so... Yeah. I think uh, we might want to end it here. <laughs> if you enjoyed this episode and want to follow us, you can listen to us and subscribe to our podcast using players like Pocket Casts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, Stitcher, Pandora and YouTube. You can also use any podcast player supporting RSS. Go to our website, hummingprojector.com, to learn how to subscribe. You can also listen to the current and previous episodes on our website without any additional software. If you have any feedback for this episode or a suggestion for a future episode, please send an email to feedback at hummingprojector.com. 
Before we end this episode, I will just add a friendly reminder about the British Film Collectors Convention that we talked about in the previous episode. The convention will be at the Shorleywood War Memorial Hall in the western edge of London, the 29th of April. Listen to the previous episode or go to bfcc.biz for more information. Even sooner, we have the Cinecy Convention on the other side of the Atlantic. It will be running from the 20th to 23rd of April in Wildwood Crest, New Jersey, USA. Detailed information can be found on the 8mm forum. You will find links to both conventions in the show notes. And with that, we have reached the end of this episode. My name is Ivan Moik, and with me I have had Douglas Warren, and thanks for listening. (laughs) 